Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this last evening event before our festival weekend celebrations. This event continues our Words Across Canada series, and we're pleased to have collaborated on tonight's conversation with Wild Words North. Wild Words North will be running their own schedule of events this weekend, September 26th and 27th, and more information is available at their website, wildwordsnorth.com. If you've been enjoying our programming so far, please leave a like on this video. Subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss a live stream, and there will be a lot this weekend. I'm Maya Bowman, and I'll be your Watts host this evening. The Word on the Street, or Watts for short, is a festival of books, ideas, and imagination, but we're also more than a festival. Watts is a community. We asked, and you told us what matters most about the Watts experience, discovery, inspiration, connection. Our community is creative and resilient, and we're excited to bring the word on the street to you in your homes. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Watts Toronto operates on land that is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabek and Allied Nations to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people with long histories on this land. We're privileged to live, work and create in these territories and strive to act with awareness and solidarity. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy, wherever you're tuning in from. You can learn more about your geography at nativeland.ca should also be in the comment live scroll below. So without further ado, let me turn things over to our host for the evening, Tracy Lindbergh. Tracy is a citizen of the Sinoachimiu Nation Rocky Mountain Cree and hails from the Kelly Lake Cree Nation community. She's an award-winning academic writer and teaches Indigenous Studies and Indigenous Law at two universities in Canada and is the best-selling author of Birdie. She sings the blues loudly, talks quietly, and is next in a long line of argumentative Cree women. Please welcome Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Thank you so much, Maya. It's my pleasure to be able to welcome people virtually as well to the territory of the Coast Salish peoples. I'm currently on Coast Salish territory and thankful to be here and acknowledge that their laws are binding and that their uh, territory and ceremonies are sacred to those of us who are visiting it as well. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce you to two fantastic people and great writers. Tonight, Helen Knott, will be the first person that I introduce. Helen is from the Deneza and Nehewak, she's a Deneza and Nehewak writer, spoken word poet and advocate from the Prophet River First Nations, living in Port St. John, BC. Currently completing a master's in First Nation studies at UNBC, Helen was recently named one of 16 Nobel laureate honor world activists and one of 150 indigenous Canadian artists honored with the Natitian Foundation Reveal Indigenous Art Award. She's published short stories on poetry in the Malahat Review, Red Rising Magazine, CBC Arts, the Surviving Canada Anthology, along other publications and poetry video productions. Helen has forthcoming academic pieces that focus on connecting violence against Indigenous lands and bodies. Her first book, In My Own Moccasins, was released in fall 2019 by the University of Regina Press, and it's magnificent. It's my pleasure to introduce you as well to Jesse Thistle, uh, Dr. Thistle is Métis Cree from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. He is an assistant professor in Métis studies at York University in Toronto. He was a finalist for the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize and the Indigenous Voices Awards, won a Governor General's Academic Medal in 2016, and is a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Scholar. And from the ashes, his extraordinary inspiring debut memoir, Jesse, once a high school dropout and now a rising Indigenous scholar, chronicles his life on the streets and how he overcame trauma and addiction to discover the truth about who he is. And I am fortunate enough to be able to call him my little brother. Welcome all. Hi. Where Hi. are you? Tell people whose territory you're on. <laughs> I am in Fort St. John. So I'm in my traditional territory of the Deniza people. So I'm, I'm close to home. And I'm broadcasting from Hamilton, Ontario, uh, Haudenosaunee Territory, Anishinaabe Territory, and uh, I'm happy to be broadcasting from the Hammer. This is so lovely to be able to see you both and speak with you both. I, I wish that we were in the same room, but I keep telling people 
as an asocial person, I'm not antisocial, I'm just asocial. I've been training for this my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just here thinking and asking questions, which is what I would dream that I could be doing from my home and my pajamas usually. I wanted to ask you guys a couple of questions generally to situate you um, in the work for people who haven't read it. But I'm also going to ask you some of the questions that I wish that people had asked me that they weren't asking when I was touring around with my book. I want to know who it is that got you in the room. Who are the people who supported you to be able to be here today? Do you want to start, Helen? Yeah, I think that's an important question because we're all here, like, based on the sacrifices and work of others. Um, two main people come to mind. So one would be my late mom. Um, who passed last fall because of the content that I was working through, there was a lot of turbulence and my mom was there to hold me up and put me back together through that writing process. And then if we're looking like more in terms of the writing world, Kim Anderson was amazing throughout this entire process. And it went from like, I remember being in school and reading um, in uh, one of her texts and and then eventually um, her helping me with the I guess the initial manuscript and giving me support and love and feedback and even I think a month before the book came out I called her and I was like I need you to talk me down because I'm having anxiety like did I do the wrong thing and she was like okay you know, I have a long car ride, let's talk it out. And, you know, she just affirmed me and kept me back together. And there's so many people behind the scenes that um, contribute to being able to be here today. Thank you. Jesse, how about you? Uh, I would have to say my grandmother, Jackie, was always walks with me. She passed away when I was in treatment many years ago. And I made her a promise to be a better person and to uh, help the world instead of hurting it. And so me uh, writing my memoir is a kind of a testament to her strength. And then Lucy, my wife, of course, she's always there with me. She uh, is the better half of our relationship, I would say, and the strength here. Um, and then my, my elder in Saskatchewan, Maria, uh, who, uh, is stern with me and she tells me the truth and she humbles me, you know, and uh, she teaches me what it means to be a machif Nehea person. She can be tough. She one time said to me, oh no, to a friend of mine, lots of Indian women look good in turquoise. You're not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and she's being honest. You know, if we say that you can't wear that color anymore. <laughs> I was thinking that often when people read Indigenous work, the words that they use to describe us or the words they use to describe memoirs, fiction, we often hear resilience come up. And I often think that resilience and redemption are sort of easy ways out to formulate some really complex ideas and relationships. So I wanted to ask you, if you were putting together five descriptive words to describe your work so that people in the future can find it in the library. What would those five words you hope be? Jesse, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think uh, the, this is a hard question, actually. Uh, I don't think it's so much survival. I think it, I mean, it's so much resilience. It's more survival, right? That like it's, there's, there's an element of survival for a lot of adoptees from my generation. Uh, reclamation of culture is another one. So survival, reclamation. Um, recovery is a big uh, thread that runs through my book. Um, love is another one. And finally, I would probably go with um, education or the quest for education. And so those are all themes that are in my book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Helen? Um, grit, <laughs> healing. I think kinship would be one of the big things. Um, I like using the term remembering. I know it's not something that somebody Googles or, <laughs> or uses as a keyword to look up, 
but remembering um, because so much of what I do is, is tied to memory. And then is that four? I think that's four. And then uh, reclamation, just because I'm going to steal one from (laughs) Jesse. I think I want to pull out the word love that Jesse had brought forward as well and ask you both of you. I think that loving is an act of bravery. And I think that both works are filled with incredible amounts of love. I also think that part of the love that I read about or that I see within them, I think the first if there is any such thing as reconciliation, the first level of reconciliation is reconciliation with self. And I think that both of you show an amazing healing, recovery, redemption, all of it, and being able to find real love for yourself. And I was wondering, not so much about that, but how you were able to translate your love for others through much of this trauma in being able to be loving people who'd experienced such pain, trauma, and hurt. How you were able to record that and be a person who looked at it with grace and kindness, because I still think, I think that even at my age, I wouldn't be able to write with that sort of love for other people that you two have written about. So I don't know if you have ideas about that. Do you want to go first, Helen, or? Sure. Um. When I think about, um, okay, so first off, there were some angry drafts. <laughs> just say that. There were some angry drafts in the process of writing that book. Um, and each time I sat with it, you know, so I sat and, and went back to the events that I talked about. And it was so cathartic because it was my own healing journey of looking of, of where did I sit with with whatever event or whoever had caused me harm or who did I cause harm um, and coming to a better place with that every time I did an edit um, because it was a healing process and knowing that um, whatever I was going to write was going to be put out into the world and how did I want it to be put out? I guess like just focusing on the intention behind it in terms of of healing. And I think um, when there's a lot of harm, it's, it's almost like these like chasms that have been created by the world, these wounds that I've learned how to fill with love um, and have been shown by others how to, how to fill that with love. And when I come from a place like that, I don't have a, a lot of space for judgment for other people and even understanding where I've been and what I've done and what that looks like. And I really find um, there's something that I wrote before and it was like the colonial objective has won when we fail to find a home in each other and it's understanding that. And so I always kind of put love at the the forefront, Um, even with work I do, not even just outside of writing, but within communities and knowing that um, I think all the other stuff is just kind of gets in the way i can see, see the Jesse's cat. Cat. <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry so, that will go to jesse <laughs> speaking of love you know uh, I, I i find wisdom in your words i think that for me um yeah when we don't find home in each other there's there's a gap in our hearts and for me i was filled with hate for many years right i hurt the world i was a criminal and uh, i did a lot of bad things to a lot of good people and that was driven by my resentments right? Because I was angry at what the world had taken from me. So early, I was taken out of my community. I lost my culture. I lost my connection to land and language. And that fueled within me this resentment. And that resentment almost killed me, actually. It really did. I almost lost my leg. I almost, you know, died multiple times. But it was returning through my program to love and learning to love creator, learning to love myself first, learning to love the people around me that were helping me that when I wrote my book, I had like 10 years of sobriety behind me sorting through all of those resentments that had made me so sick. And I tried to replace, and like Helen said, write it in a good way with honest intention behind it without trying to hurt other people that, that hurt me, you know, and I had to write with the right intention of love in my heart. Sorry, my cat is going to knock this off the thing here. I'll fix it. But uh, yeah, that's, that's what guided my work and, 
and my connection to creator and uh, it was guided by love. Hold on one second. <laughs> we will hold on one second. <laughs> well, Sorry, seconds. Guys. <laughs> thank you. I wanted to talk a little bit about that notion of reconciliation with self as one level. When um, one of my elders provides teaching, she always talks about self, family, community, nation, and that moving out. And if the book is the place where you reconcile with yourself, is there a moment when you're writing this all out when you think, oh, this is this is going to be a book? Like, are you writing it initially for you? Are, are you writing it with an audience in mind? So I'm going to ask you both, when you're writing it, what were you thinking was going to come of it? Was it going to look like this? Were you going to be talking to Word on the Street to Toronto in 2020? Helen? Um, I don't even know. I feel like there was a lot of trust in the writing of my book. Um, and that trust was like in creator and whatever plans were laid out before me and the purpose of this book, because some of the things that I talk about within my journey, it's like, does that need to, it was scary. It was really scary. And so there had to be that trust of there was somebody who needed to read that, who had a similar story. And so for me, it was with that, um, with keeping that in mind, that it would find its way to hands that needed to hold the book. And that's how I wrote that. And obviously like parts were, were for me and there were sections that didn't kind of make it into the final book, but all of that, that process of writing, um, was for myself, but it was knowing that it would make it into somebody's hands. I didn't know it would end up here with Jesse and you, Tracy, um, but I am grateful that it led me here. Thank you. Jesse, how about you? When did you know it was a book and it was for you and for the world, I guess, or who was it for? Uh, originally, my book is just my co a collection of my AA steps. That's all it was that I'd been doing from rehab. So I didn't think other people were going to read it. And I was presented with the opportunity to write my book by Simon & Schuster after they heard about some of my academic work in community, actually with history, reclamation of history, elder stories and whatnot. And so I took the opportunity, I sent them off my AA uh, steps that I'd been writing and they said that it would make a wonderful book. So I'm like an accidental author and I never really intended to write a book, I'm glad that it's gotten out there. I thought maybe, you know, a handful of people would read it and like I could get on with being a professor because that's how I see myself. And it's just turned into something completely larger than what I ever thought it would be. And so I'm very grateful for that. But uh, in knowing that, in writing, working with my editor, I had to consider how it would affect my family, how it would affect my people, Métis people. Do I perform my indigeneity or do I try to like talk about like what's actually happening with Métis uh, people that I work and know and try to represent that as, as honestly as I could. And so all those factors came in and that's what produced the book. When I um, launched a birdie out at Kelly Lake, uh, where my family is from, I've not lived there. When I launched it out there, I said I was very, very nervous to one of my little mothers. And she said to me, don't worry, my girl. Nobody thinks it's about them. But it was about them. <laughs> it was about that answer specifically. <laughs> and so in that reconciliation with family, I'm wondering to what degree you've reconciled with your family. I, I know that because it's about them, it informs my relations with my family. How does this sort of pin for people who want to know, how does this um, keep you engaged in the process of being a good relation? And has there been challenges that have come about because of your publication? Because I was always told, keep that stuff secret. That's nobody's business. Once it's everybody's business, what happens? Do you want to go first, Jesse? Yeah, yeah. My, my family's racked by trauma, intergenerational trauma, both sides, my dad and my mom. And so... 
I drew from a lot of scholarship, actually, like Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart. She taught, she's a social worker and she talks about public grieving. She said, we heal from intergenerational trauma by public grieving. So that means doing the opposite of what you said. We have to air our dirty laundry and we have to talk about what happened and we have to do it in a voice that's non-accusatory. And so when I did that, most of my family loved the book. My brother, Josh, he uses it with his therapy. He's a retired RCMP. He's got PTSD from work and he's talking about things that he never could before because he just didn't have the strength of the words. Uh, other, uh, my mom and me have a great relationship from the book. Um, so it's been very beautiful. It's brought, brought a lot of us closer, but there are of course people in the family that dissent and don't see things how I saw that. And so there's been some tension there, but I think it's like ripping off a bandaid, right? If the bandaids formed into the wound, you have to rip it off. It's going to be painful at first, but then it can finally heal. And so. That's what writing my memoir has done with my family, for sure. Thank you. Ella? Um, so with my parents, we had discussions previously. So when my mom was still here and leading up to the release of the book, um, because we both went through addiction and came through it and, you know, repaired our relationship where we, where we were really, really close, it was with that understanding of, well, this is, this is a book that's supposed to help um, others who also have addiction within their family generationally. And so with that, it kind of moved forward. Um, I know that uh, when I wrote, I also wrote mindfully not to include certain things because I felt it would interrupt other people's healing journeys within my family. So there's things that I left out um, with that understanding too. And then it opened up conversations specifically with with one of my aunties where we started talking about role because she's like, well, I was, you know, I didn't know where I was during this time or what did that look like and how do I want to, you know, be an auntie differently to, you know, the little ones that are coming up. And it, it even kind of um, created a conversation for myself too of like, well, what is my role and how do I hold that within, you know, the young ones within my family and then in community, et cetera. So I think it was, really beneficial in that way. Um, and I think it, it was, it was good. I, I think there was always that little bit of worry of maybe some potential pushback, but it, it didn't happen. Everybody just seems super happy for, for Northern voices and Northern stories. So. I want to ask in your uh, book, you say, I hope that Matthias uh, never reads this. But if he does, I want him to know. I want to know if there's a part of you that feels like this is the book that you wish was on the shelves for you. And if there's, uh, if it has a sort of piece of it that you edited out for yourself or for others, if there's something that you wish you had kept in it. So two parts first. Um, if not Matthias, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. You are. <laughs> if not Matthias, then um, do you see a place for this in Northern communities, Northern libraries, Northern literature? Is there a place where you hope that it gets placed? And then secondly, and I'll ask Jesse this question as well. The second one is in terms of an edit, was there something, not regret, but something that you wish that you had written about or that you hadn't kept in or that you've thought about more now? that will become the subject of your next work or the subject of the next piece. So working within um, social work and as a helper within the territory, I know that even within this region that I'm from, that there's a lot of women and young women that share the same story as me. And so for me, you know, I feel like my work holds a place because it makes that that isolation and that loneliness um, less than what it is. And, you know, it builds connections between us because it is such an isolating thing, especially if you come from communities and families that um, originally, not originally, but throughout time came to a space of intergenerational silence where you don't talk about things, right? Where things are kind of kept hush-hush. 
but opening and breaking open that conversation of like, this is what's been happening. Um, so I think with, with that, and then with my son, Matthias, um, yeah, still <laughs> like it, maybe one day he will, you know, read that book. And I think about it with younger audiences too, because I, I'm, I know that some people are using it in, um, like the alternative learning schools yeah. and my book has been like featured in there. And so sometimes I, I worry, I'm like, ah, you know, having it with younger readers or teenage readers, but I'm like, okay, but if they're living the life I was living as a teenager, then this is relatable. Right. Um, and I think had I, I can't say what it would have been if I had read something like my own work, but I think it would have made me less lonely, especially with a lot of the feelings that I held because those are feelings that you don't, that I wrote about that people don't tend to talk about um, and scared of like confirmation of like, yeah, you know, you really are inherently a, a bad person. So you keep that to yourself and you're like, if, if this is what I think, I don't want to say it out loud just in case yeah. somebody out there might like affirm it. Right. So. And then the second part was if there was anything that you wish you had included or that you had self-edited out that now when you think about it, you think I'm going to write about that part next or again or sometime. There was a, a chapter um, in there that kind of dealt with uh, potential relapse and just sobriety maintenance. And it was this like weird moment that I had um, when I was in, in Vancouver, but it was talking about, you know, because usually at the end of the book, it's like, oh, ta-da, they got sober at the end. <laughs> that's it where in reality like staying sober is hard work and there's a lot of like near misses and like things that happen and so there was a chapter that talked about that and I wish I had kept that in too um because it's you know it's not just a like a once and for all you're sober there's those challenges along the way and and it depends on how you um meet those challenges be because it comes down to everyday choices that's really smart and thoughtful. Thank you. Jesse, how about you? Is there pieces that you wish were still there or something that you'd wish you'd thought more about or you're going to take forward and do in your next works? Yeah, yeah. There was a few moments there right at the end of my addiction. I think it was the turning point of my life where a stranger offered to buy me a pair of shoes and he was a, a, a doctor and he was like the first guy in a long time to like treat me kindly. And he offered me to buy these brand new shoes, but I was an addict and I, I didn't want to betray his, uh, his kindness, you know? And so I refused the shoes and he refused to leave me and he took me out for breakfast. And I thought that was like a moment in time where I thought if I, if I would have sold those shoes, taken them and sold them, that I would have lost a real fundamental part of my humanity, uh, to my addiction. I just couldn't do that. And so that was a real turning point for me. I wish that had made it in. I wrote it in a didactic chapter. So in a conversation rather than like a, a, a narrative, like the rest of my book is, mm -hmm. and it just didn't fit. So the editor made the executive decision to pull it out. And beyond that, like what Helen is saying, I wish there was more space for the, the back end of the book. So the work that it took to get from being, you know, an addict who's struggling, going in and out of rehab to someone who became like a scholar. And like that would have taken another two or 300 pages, but I'm not Leo Tolstoy, right? And they don't give that many pages to first time Indigenous authors. So we're trying to rectify that actually now. We're working at a deal for a mini series and they want to focus on the love story, right? Uh, between Lucy, because a lot of the work was her every day drawing on my back, you know, the touch that I didn't have a ch as a child because I didn't have my family, right? The trust, getting up early every day and having all the support of the, all the academics that were around me, creating me and helping me become who I am today. So keep your eyes out for it. We're working out the deal now and it should be a more uplifting uh, story than just my memoir, so. Thank you, I will look for it. When um, so I have a little piece of the experience that you guys have as a first time writer where you get put into the public eye and have that 
conversation. And at one place that I went to talk to, um, another author brought up the term poverty porn when describing my book. And I have gone to great lengths not to be the person who glamorizes trauma or makes trauma um, intellectually soothable or accessible in that way. Trauma should be traumatic for the people who aren't experiencing it. I think in my own way that that's the only way that it ever becomes safer for everybody. So I'm wondering if there were parts of each of you where you first worried that writing about this would invite people in who shouldn't be in that space or if you worried that putting it out into the world might, um, I don't know, in some way make it not accessible, but make it an easier climb for people to have their own public redemption because they read this book, if that makes sense. So I'm wondering yeah. about that, if you had concerns about that along the way. Jesse? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, some people have read my book and there's been very public critiques of my book that way. And uh, the way that I see it uh, is I have, you know, have to show the trauma of what I've been through, what my family's gone through, the horrors of addiction and, and just being hopeless. But along the way, there are moments of human connection all through my book. There are shining moments of love. There are shining moments of, of teachings that I'm learning in the darkest places like jail. I learned from priests how to share. I learned from the Chinese lady when I stole and she gave me pork that I'm, stealing was wrong and I'm stealing from good people. I learned love from my brother who always had my back and took me in. So all the way through, I had these lessons, but if you're looking for the trauma narrative in indigenous writing and you're from the mainstream, when you read it, you're not going to pick up on all those lessons along the way. You're going to pick up on what you're looking for in the book. And so people who are from, who are uh, misplaced uh, or adopted out Métis people see it themselves in my book and they see what I'm trying to do, but the mainstream has missed a lot of that, right? Or if they haven't lived a life similar to that. So you, and you, you play, you know, that's, that's just part of writing a book. You have to write it, put it out there. And you say, I wrote it for me to express the way what I went through. Hopefully people will understand the lessons. And if they don't, that's not my business. You know, that's on them. And that's the way I look at it. Yeah. That's what one of my teachers said as well. You can't write for anybody else. You have to write for you. And that's their stuff. I my shorthand is let other people carry their own bags. <laughs> How about you, Helen? Yeah, I think um, being aware when my book was kind of going to press of how it could be understood and how it it you know because sometimes that that critique or that feedback of something being quote unquote like poverty or trauma porn um, coming from literary spheres but also from within our own indigenous lit literary spheres um and for me it's just kind of bizarre because i'm like you know we talk so much about what silencing looks like and how not to do that you know in real life in practice as helpers or as people who are um i don't want to say decolonized but like within like good relations with each other mm -hmm. and and it feels like a little bit like that, like a level of like, okay, we need to tell other stories. And I understand that because there are good stories, um, but there are still people who are living stories that are, are very similar, that are very hard. Um, and they still need to see themselves within the literary space, within books, within conversations. Um, and I think that's important. And I really thought about that because I was told at the beginning or when my book was coming out, like, oh, this will be really good for educating people. And I was like, that's, this is not what it's about. <laughs> like, I'm not writing to appeal to like a larger public consciousness to see me or humanize me. Like I have been there and I refuse to do that. And trying to make that clear from the outset within my book in the introduction that that's not what this is for. Um, one thing that I do wish that I had changed in there is that I do have a lot of like non-Indigenous women who reach out to me who say, I know that this wasn't from for me, but 
uh, this part spoke to me or this part spoke to me and they were healing parts, right? Because um, they are usually women who have like encountered sexual violence to some degree. And, you know, knowing that now, I wish I would have put in a section there that that parts, those parts are for you. Those parts are for, for anyone who has lived through that because it's not just um, struggle and pain that is, you know, an indigenous monopoly. <laughs> it's something that a lot of people can relate to throughout all of the themes. And I think we still have to create and honor spaces for those voices that are coming out because they exist. Thank you. I'm thinking in terms of the the world that we're living in right now and uh, the you who gets to look at this through a place of love, through a healing curve that you've been through and looking to indigenous peoples who are struggling in the world right now. There's a question from someone named Ramona who says, in your opinion, how has this pandemic impacted indigenous peoples currently going through trauma? Do you have any advice that you could provide for people who are currently going through it? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, early in the, the pandemic, I realized the importance of connection. I think that was like something that was taken away from a lot of us, right? And, you know, there's a lot of people who don't have access to things like Zoom or, you know, StreamYard, like what we're doing now, or mm -hmm. there's not many people around them that they can connect with. So within my community, I've tried to reach out and, and be there for people when they when I can, right, when I can. And uh, by, by reconnecting with my relationship with nature, I guess, um, it's kind of like shown me the importance of Wakudu. And so I, I try to write about that and try to talk about that as much as I can, because I think those relationships are the real ones. And a lot of like what has happened with the world has stripped away a lot of the things that don't matter, really. You know, our community, our, our connection to nature and, and the land is what is important. And so, yeah, that's just what I've been focusing on. I've written a couple articles about that. And I just try to be mindful that sometimes you should give someone a call, you know, or, or talk to your family or whoever you know that's going and having a hard time. And, uh, yeah. How much you have in the work that you do and going forward? What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, where are we going to the question that Ramona asked or were you yeah. asking a separate question? No, I'm okay. just reframing it. Okay. Um, I would say uh, control is a really big thing, um, especially if you come through a space of trauma, like there's different ways of coping beyond that. And one thing that I know um, from myself or how I've emerged is like the need to control everything. And that comes from a space of having no control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, controlling my, my schedules or, um, you know, how you kind of operate within the world. So when things kind of go outside and beyond your control, that can be really, really hard to grapple with because if it can be triggering back to those times where um, things were out of control. I've been talking with a lot of people because if you're looking at COVID and the pandemic and how it's impacted like work situations, um, which then can impact like housing and then being, you know, stuck with a partner in a home for an uh, uh, abnormal <laughs> amounts of time and that impacting the relationship and going into a space where everything feels out of control. Um, and I've had some conversations with people surrounding this and, and just looking at, at grounding, but also like, the the growth behind it um, and something that I've had to learn how to do is like let go of that idea of control and I give that kind of like over to creator and being like okay you know you brought me here like what are you gonna do <laughs> how are you getting us out of this but um, learning how to let go and knowing that things will still be okay even if I'm not like masterminding everything so that whole, that whole thought of thought. creator is going to guide this from here is part of 12-step um, programs and also part of what I understand to be is Cree understandings of 
you got to give over. Like it, it, you can't live so much in your head. You have to live in your body and live in your heart. And so I, I think often about the job that people do when they open up the door by writing about their stuff, the hard stuff, because you've essentially said, I don't control this once it gets out of my pen. I don't control this when it's on the screen, that this goes elsewhere. And I'm wondering if there's a part of you that says, well, the next thing that I do, I'm going to be led to and follow that. Or have you both got ideas about what your next piece of work is going to look like? Do you want to start, Jesse? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I guess letting go and letting creator kind of is it's that's the first step of AA, right? You have to f relinquish power to your higher power and and realize that you're not in control, right? And so, the thing about writing a memoir is it really messes with your head because you're writing a book about yourself, and then people write reviews and a lot of them are positive and it can get to your head right and so it can be guided by ego and so it can make you very sick right because a lot of addiction is, is guided by ego it's guided by self-centeredness so always cognizant of that so that's my first answer and the second half of that would be uh, my next book is actually going to be about my great uncle ronnie who uh he was a professional bank robber uh in the 80s in uh toronto and his life is kind of a testament or not a testament but a, a product of the way that a lot of our young uh men uh lost their manhood in uh, residential school and so the reaction to that is they become hyper masculine and like nobody tells a bank robber what to do and so that's them trying to reclaim their agency but in a really really toxic way and so mm -hmm. i'm going to be writing about that and that's a story in my family of the brokenness of being taken off of our land through residential school. So those are my two answers to your question. Thank you. How about you, Helen? What's the next piece? What does it look like for you? Um, I'm working on a book called Becoming a Matriarch. And so I've recently, um, within this last year, lost both my grandmother and, and my mom. And... It's funny because it was a different book that I had started before this. And once um, I was met with their, their loss, everything began to like shift and change. And I had to even let go and let go of control of, of what, you know, my next piece was going to look like because I was attached to it too. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, okay, this is something different now. And everything changed. And um, it's also a way because I... I stayed focused within in my own moccasins because there was a purpose in, in terms of stories that I told. And, and in this way, I can really pay homage to, to my mom and my grandma and to the lessons that they gave me and the love that they gave me and the stories and that relationship. Um, and also looking at, at matriarchy um, within my family, because I don't come from a tribe that is like traditionally matriarchal on my mom's side through the Dunaza. But knowing, okay, how were our lives centered around women, but also coming from women whose bodies and beings seem to belong to everybody but themselves. And how do I step into that role? And what am I going to change for that role um, for myself? You know, at this age of like 32. And I think I, I did it for like four or five months and I was like exhausted. And <laughs> I was like, how did they do this? This is not okay. <laughs> 32 you guys are just babies <laughs> and speaking of babies nice segue <laughs> i have a question from bookworm babe who says what advice do you have for first-time writers struggling with finding their voice and story and if i could translate that what i would say is when you sat down and were thinking about writing i know that for jesse you were writing this as part of your healing and part of your 12 steps but once you um, settled in and knew that it was going to be a book, what were some great pieces of advice that you got from other writers or pieces that you came up on your own to keep you driven and focused and doing the good work? Either of you can answer if you're so inclined. Do you want to go, Helen? Mm, I just remember like questioning everything because I wasn't sure of myself as a writer. Like, 
I, I loved writing since I was young, but I went to school for social work. And it always felt, and even now sometimes feel like a space that I don't belong to either. Where I'm like, are you really a writer? I don't know. <laughs> um, and so there's that distrust, right? And I remember going to uh, the Banff Arts Center, Center of Arts or whatever, and and um, someone just saying like, claim it, like claim that you're, you know, a writer and trust it. And things that I wanted to do, even in terms of like structuring. Um, and being like, can I do this? I don't know if I can do this. And someone outside of myself saying, yes, you can do that. Why can't you do that? And so learning to give yourself permission to, you know, to write, to claim your own voice in your own story, because nobody outside of yourself needs to give you that either. And that's something that um, I've been working on claiming like, even, even now. Because when you work, sometimes, you know, you're writing in a, in a silo by yourself and nobody sees your work for a while. And you could be like, this could be complete shit. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and wanting, you know, outside affirmation. But yeah, so just trusting more in yourself and your voice. Jesse? Yeah, I relate a lot to that. I don't see myself as an author still. I may be a storyteller, but I don't know. Author is like some, you know, lofty title that people that write big, thick books, uh, uh, you know. So I still have that uh, imposter syndrome within me, and I don't think it'll ever go away. Um, while I was writing, I, I, I Googled, how do you write? You know, because, like, I'm, I am relearned how to read and write in jail, right? So I'm like a jailbird. So I, I have very low confidence in the way that I write. So I found this drunk guy on YouTube. His name is Bukowski. And he was giving writing to when, he, when he was drunk. And he's like, it's all about story and pace. You got to go bim, 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 and keep them interested and don't be fancy. It's all about direct, plain language. That's what people want to write. So I tried to write like that. And I just, every time I like got caught up in the art of writing, I just like, I have to tell the story in the clearest words, simplest words possible. And that helped me strip down and pare down my writing. And when I sent it off to my editor, she would, you know, pieces would disappear if they sucked and I wouldn't get feedback. Or she would come back and say, this is good writing. Keep writing like this. And so she was assuring me the whole way through because I have that inherent lack of confidence with my writing. How did you guys get to the companies you got to or how did you get to the editors you got to? How did you have the confidence to take it from your desk to another person? And who were the people who opened up doors for you, I guess? For me, I, the first reader for my work was Maria Campbell. And Maria said, it needs a lot of work. And she sent me to a woman who had edited some of her stuff before, before it ever got to a company. There was sort of a process to get it there, but I never would have known where to go. I actually did a Google for um, Indian and agents, which brought up a large <laughs> issue of Canada. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the place where I found my agent to be able to work for Birdie. So a lot of it for me has just been Forrest Gump luck, the indigenous Forrest Gump showing up at the right place at the right time. For people who are looking for direction and how to get there and how to get their work in front of people and how to get an agent, that sort of first stuff, you're still there for a lot of that. How did you find your way and who helped lead you there? Helen, do you want to go? Oh, I was like trying to nod him in. I'm like, go. Oh, <laughs> <you know, so." laughs> um, yeah. So I actually didn't go like a traditional way with an agent or anything like that. I think the first person who read my work was Kim Anderson. I was working on a different article with her about uh, the connection between land and body violence. And then she read that bit of my manuscript. Um, and she gave me that encouragement to move forward. And what had happened actually was somebody, um, because within the work of like social work and justice or whatever, um, I made a lot of connections and someone who I did a podcast with um, just decided that she was going to, without me knowing too, was like going to pitch my book to people at different things she went to, which was really amazing. Her name is Shelly Wire with um, Indigenous Women Warriors. So she does like fitness and podcasts. And so she did that and she ended up creating um, inroads with me with two different publishing houses 
And that's how I ended up with the University of Regina Press. And that was just through, you know, sisterhood and um, connection and relationships. So I was really grateful for that. Wow. That's incredible. I didn't know that. I I saw you once in, uh, I think it was uh, in Toronto and you, you, you blew everybody out of the water. And that's when I knew that you would have like an incredible book to write. But for me, it was an accidental thing too. I, uh, I, I'm an academic and I focused on my studies and I won uh, some major awards in my undergrad and then in my doctoral work and that created media attention. And they did, it came to do a Toronto Star article on my life and I told them about my past life on the streets as an addict and, and how I got to university was basically by robbing that store way back when. That was the beginning of it and so that caught media attention and Simon and Schuster came to me. So I didn't have a manuscript. I didn't have anything. All I had was my connection, my uh, collection of AA steps. And so I sent that off and then they offered me a major publishing contract and they assigned me a senior editor that they waited to get from Shad Lane, I believe her name's Lori Grassi. And really the strength of the writing in the book comes from her expertise as an ex as an editor. So, uh, yeah, non-traditional route over here, but I do strongly suggest that you get an uh, an agent, not an Indian agent, but an agent first, because you need to get those contracts right, because, you know, yeah. a lot of money is on the, the line, and if you don't have it sorted out, it's, that's a very different world, and uh, yeah, you live and learn, right? You live and learn, so. Yeah. If uh, the stuff that you're doing now, we've, we've heard what it is that you might write next and where you're moving next. We've heard uh, how you're living your life by reading your books. I'm wondering if, in terms of the next, if there are other Indigenous authors who are coming up that you are paying attention to and learning from now, if there's people you'd like to bring to the public's imagination. I'll remind people that Erica Violet Lee Lindsay Nixon, Chelsea Val, Camille Campbell, Joshua Whitehead, Sonia Ballantyne, Dallas Hunt, and Billy Ray Belcourt continue to make magic. Are there other people, either old school or new, that you'd like to bring forward and tell people about? Uh, there's a, a fellow I went to the BAM Center with, and uh, I think he just won some kind of award or was shortlisted. His name is Troy Sebastian, and he's Ken, 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 uh, huh? And, uh, but every time we talk, I'm always like, when's your book coming out? Because I've read ex- excerpts of it. And, you know, it's like, uh, like indigenous family and there's like Chinese food and bingo halls and like laughter. And I'm obsessed with his writing. So I know that he's, he's coming closer and I'm so anticipating his voice emerging into the world. I recently did like a single parent writer's prize. Um, and there were phenomenal writers like it that submitted prizes that we didn't end up giving prizes to but one she was a poet um eco aboriginal is what she goes by her name is janelle um and she wrote a poem called 10 reasons to save res dogs and it blew me away like it was it was an amazing work so there's so many voices out there waiting to like emerge and burst out into the scene so thanks jesse yeah i would have to tip my hat to uh David Robertson, I think he's uh, he's a long time, like he's been around forever. Uh, Gregory Schofield is another one that I think he's an incredible, again, longer term writer. Uh, the best write, writer that I ever heard is an unknown writer. Her name's Stephanie Wesley. I heard her, uh, I don't know if you guys know who Renee Eigenbold is. She used to work for the University of uh, Winnipeg, I believe, in Manitoba. And she brought all like new emerging authors that were indigenous uh, in 2013 to Winnipeg. And she had a written a story and I heard it there. So shout out to her. Lance Morrison, one of my former students last year, a far better writer than I am. Uh, he wrote a, like a play about uh, Gabriel Dumont. Uh, and it really was incredible. And it was about Rial and uh, Nancy Cooper friend of mine who writes uh, Anishinaabe Moan children's story. And of course, Helen Knott. I tip my hat because I, I know that her memoir is far 
a superior in writing technique than my own. I've read both. And so I uh, just tip my hat to all those people. That's generous of you. I think that one of the things that I, when going through the sort of machinations of showing up and talking about your work, the one question I was never asked was about form. Like the way that I write or the voice that I write in or the shifting tense, verb tense or anything like that. And both of you have poetry within your work. And I would say that lots of the poetry doesn't look like poetry, it's just regular writing within the work. That being said, aside from form, is there a question that you always wish somebody would ask you that they have not? And what's the question you're afraid people will ask you? <laughs> wow. You want to take that one, Helen? <laughs> I don't even, like, Usually, like, because I am fairly, like, introverted, introverted, and I can, like, fake um, being extrovert. Usually when the questions are done, I'm just glad that they're done. So I don't really necessarily have, like, uh, a question um, that I'm missing or that I wish that people would have asked. Something that I'm scared of um, would... I don't even know. Jesse, you're going to have to take this. Okay. Yeah. Question I wish people would ask uh, more about my grandma, Jackie. She was like so central to my life and like she never gets, um, no one ever asks about like her role as the matriarch of our family. You know, she's kind of like the strong woman in my story, you know. Um, people... I'm afraid to be asked about my father a lot and my relationship to my father because that's really broken. My story is, a, you know, in a lot of ways, a story of broken Indigenous men and our failure to live up to our roles. And so I'm uh, afraid people ask me, how have I failed as an Indigenous man? Because I have in many ways, and I'm trying to fix that. You know, that's about, that's what it's, it means to end intergenerational traumas, to learn those roles and, so it's a hard road, you know, and my brothers and me and others of my generation are trying to reclaim those roles, but where some of us are doing it better than others. And I, I would say that I'm learning along with them. So thank you. That's hard and honest. And I really didn't actually ask that question or expect anybody to answer it. So I'm very touched that you did and thankful that you're generous in that way, Jesse. Now I want you to know that my second question that I rushed right by our was there's some pretty strong women in your stories. <laughs> I think about your grandma, I think about your Asa and your mom. So I was going to ask the one question that nobody ever asks you, just uh -huh. so you know. <laughs> Yeah. But I got panicky. Things got <laughs> uh, scary in here. Is there anything else you guys would like to add? Anything we missed? Anything that you want people to be aware of because you have their attention right now? Just thank you that, to everybody who listens or uh you know took the time today like uh i look at it like i'm panhandling and i'm trying to keep people's attention you know because i remember what that was like and so mm -hmm. this is kind of like that too and so like i'm glad that you guys shared the the stage with me tonight so i could you know put my hand out and and ask people for their generosity thank yeah. you i'm very grateful um to be here and to share space. I've been wanting to meet you, Tracy, for a very long time and uh, have been looking forward to reuniting uh, and sharing a space with, with Jesse as well. I just wanted to add that I'm super excited for you know your future work, Jesse, especially because it's focusing on, on you and L Lucy's love story. Like I am a fan of your love story. So I'm really <laughs> excited about this. Um, and just, I look forward to that. So, yeah. Oh. Thank you. And maybe we're trying to have a baby right now. So if you guys can put some tobacco down, we've been trying for a long time. So that would make our love story perfect. So, yeah. Mm, most certainly will. And we have hit well, six o'clock where I am. What time is it where you guys are? <laughs> well, it's nine. Same time. Oh, Fort St. John's. All right. Yeah. And now we have Maya back to escort us out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could have had you all gathered in a building. Um, 
we're yeah we're really grateful to have uh, gathered you all and tabled this conversation and um, yeah uh, it was it was really exciting to hear you guys say that you especially Helen and Tracy you guys wanted to meet um, that's what we love to do at Watts is bring people together so uh, I know this is just a you know, maybe a pale shadow of what we uh, you know usually can do but um, yeah we're just so grateful to have been, had you all here with us tonight. Thank you so much for sharing and, and speaking so candidly about your journeys in publishing, writing, and elsewhere and else how. Um, I know the audience in the comments has been with you the entire way. Uh, definitely go take a look at that afterwards. I know Aisha um, on the back end has been passing some comments to you in the private chat that we have. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It was, uh, yeah, we're really grateful to have had you. Thank you so much for hosting. I'm really happy to have spent time with all of you. Yes, mercy to all of you. Yeah, and thank you to everybody tuning in at home. Uh, if you'd like to order any of the books mentioned in this programming, you can head over to Another Story Bookstore, uh, either their website, anotherstory.ca, or they're also live in our digital marketplace. That link should be dropping in the comment roll. Uh, and exciting news, starting at 10 a.m. tomorrow, we're presenting our first ever virtual festival of storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Find all the Watts Toronto events you have come to expect and other goodies on three concurrent live streams right here on YouTube um, and a new version of our festival community spaces on our Watts Toronto Discord server. Don't let the name fool you. It is a gentle and harmonious place for discussion, asking staff questions uh, and interacting with authors and exhibitors who have chosen to join us there. If you haven't already, check out our digital marketplace. Link is in the co uh, live comment roll now and our exhibitors are open for business until September 30th. Um, to support The Word on the Street and events just like this one, please visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca and click that donate button. Thank you everybody for joining us and have a great evening.